Okay. Um, obviously, we're moving on from what we previously did. Uh, the last unit we focused on finding the roots, the zeros, the x-intercepts, uh, solutions to higher order polynomials. Uh, and then we graph those. Uh, obviously, finding the x-intercepts first by factoring it, setting it equal to zero, solving, uh, finding those solutions, knowing that the real solutions uh, are your x-intercepts. Uh, and then we graph it, right? And those were some difficult ones to graph. Now we're going to focus on quadratics more. Because in reality, you're going to be dealing with quadratics and cubic functions mostly. You're not going to be dealing with the higher order. Now, as you get in the calculus and you get into engineering and all that, obviously you'll need more of that. But for, for the most part, you're going to need to deal with quadratics and cubic functions and exponential functions all right, and radical functions. So we're going to try and start knocking those out one by one because those are the most important ones. Now what we used in the last thing you're going to use in this as well except it's going to be in a much easier form. Alright, so we're going to really try and talk about the basics of a quadratic function and graphing these quadratic functions. Now let me ask you this, looking at this function right here, now don't, don't write anything down, just pay attention. Um, looking at that function, can you tell me what the end behaviors would look like of this and what the generic form would be. Now again, I erased all the, probably should have erased this board, but my <laughs> other period needs that more than they need the end uh, behaviors. But uh, can you tell me what the end behaviors would look like? We're dealing with a what? Quadratic. Uh, well, quadratic, obviously. We're dealing with a function that has a leading coefficient of what? which is greater than zero, right? And we're dealing with an even function. So we're dealing with something that looks like this, correct? Now what goes on in between here in the higher order polynomials is what we figured out what we just did, right? Well now we don't have all this junk in between. It is gonna look very similar to that. So you already know the basic look of this. This is what we call a parabola. I'm sure you heard of it before, all right? And we're going to get better at graphing this parabola without having to make an xy chart. The most basic way of graphing anything is to create your xy chart, or x f of x chart, and picking points, right? Go negative 1, negative 2, 0, 1, 2, and pick some others, and then see what we get here, right? See if we can get a look that looks similar to that. Because we do know that it's going to look similar to that based on what we previously did. Well, that's a lot of work, isn't it? Plugging it in, squaring it, doing all that junk. There's a much easier way of graphing this, a much quicker way of graphing this. Okay, before, this is all you've learned to graph this. Okay, the higher order ones, we found the x-intercepts, plotted the x-intercepts, determined the end behaviors, and found out the junk that goes in between, right? Again, that's a long process. There are easier, pro uh, easier ways of doing this. And that's what we're going to kind of build into. We're going to find an easier way of graphing this quadratic function. Now, in order to graph these, we have to talk about two different forms. One of them is standard form, which is what you're used to seeing. This is standard form of a quadratic, meaning your x squared term is first, your x term, then your constant is next. It's in standard form, right? We've talked about that before with polynomials. Are we in standard form? And again, I put it in generic terms. It's basically degree order from greatest to least, right? We all know that. We've done that before when we multiply polynomials instead of put it into standard form. Okay? This is our standard quadratic form, specifically a quadratic function in standard form. This helps us find the zeros, the roots, the solutions, our x-intercepts, like we've already talked about. We will need to know that. Because okay, it is one easy, quick, easy way of graphing this function. Right. Um, the second form that we need to talk about is vertex form. Now, this is a little bit more complex. However, this makes it really easy to graph. Because we can graph any quadratic formula if we're able to get it in this vertex form. And this vertex form looks like this. And I'll give you an example here. But it is the generic form is when you have a function where you have some constant in front of the parentheses, x minus some number, quantity squared, plus k. Uh, 
All right, that's the generic form, and something, a function that would be similar to that would be something that looks like this. All right, when you're in this form, your h comma k, or your constant that is in here, and your constant that is out here, is the vertex of your parabola, the vertex of your quadratic function. And again, we before we determined that this looks like that, all right? Where is the vertex of this particular function? Just point on it on the graph. Where do you think it is? Is it up here? Is it here? Is it here? Where do you think the vertex of a function is? Right here. It is the turning point when it goes from decreasing to increasing. That's your vertex of your function. So if we're able to determine the vertex of a function, and sooner or later able to determine the x-intercepts of a function, we might be able to graph this, right? That's going to be one method to doing it. And that's what we got to do, but we got to first understand how to get from quadratic to vertex form so we can get that vertex. And then from there, everything else becomes easy. That's the key. When we are specifically looking at graphing quadratics, this is the easiest form to use. However, I'm going to be giving it to you in that form. So you've got to be able to make some conversions and be able to go back and forth. All right? When graphing, each of these A, H, and K have some responsibility, have some uh, way of impacting this graph itself. The A controls how narrow or wide your parabola is. So as we get more and more into this, deeper and deeper into this concept, we'll understand what that A will do what happens when it's like positive 5, what happens when it's negative 5, what happens when it's positive 1 fourth, what happens when it's negative 1 fourth. This controls how narrow, how wide, and the direction, meaning up or down, that this parabola is. Your H controls the left and right movements on your x-axis. It controls your x movement of the vertex from the origin. I will, show, I will show you all this as we get deeper and deeper into it. K controls your up and down movement of your vertex on your y-axis. All right, controls the y-axis movement. And if we're able to get it in this form, it's very easy to graph. So before we can even really dive deep into this, we need to understand how to go from standard form into vertex form. Now, let's take a look at number one. That's the little intro right there, kind of the basics. Let's take a look at number one here. We've got to get this standard form quadrat into vertex form. Now, when you look at vertex form, what do you notice we have right here? We have a perfect square right here. So somehow we got to find a perfect square that exists in here. Is that a perfect square right now? Now, if we were to try and factor this, we'd realize, oh, this is not a perfect square, right? If we had another number on the outside, we might be able to have a perfect square here. Okay? But there's no perfect square right now. All right? So in order to get it into this form, i got to create a perfect square. Problem is, what's causing the biggest problem from this not being a perfect square? Mm, I wouldn't say the coefficient. What? The negative 5, right? Because that's not a perfect square. Is this a perfect square? Remember, when we determine if something was a perfect square, we look at the first, and then we look at the last, right? And if this were a perfect square, and that were a perfect square, then we take the makeups of them, multiply it together, double it, and make sure it's middle, right? And if it were, then we end up saying, okay, x plus 4 squared, right? That's what we'd end up. That's what we want to eventually get to, is a perfect square, so that we can get it in vertex form. But as we just said, this is causing a problem from there being a perfect square. So to convert this into vertex form, we're going to use a method called completing the square. Completing the perfect square is what I like to call it, but it is the process is called completing the square. Has anyone heard of completing the square before? Couple might have heard of it, probably don't know how to do it. You know how to do it? Okay, that's all right. We've got to complete the square. Now, to do this, there's multiple ways of kind of doing it. It's all the same thing, but I always tell everyone start by making it a 
y equals 1. Because remember, because functions are always relations, but not always as a relation of function. So we can always go from f of x to y. And doing that will just allow us, uh, it's going to be a little easier to work with. So I'm going to rewrite it as a y equals. And I'm going to move away the problematic area. I'm going to move away this problematic area by adding 5. y plus 5 is now equal to x squared minus 2x. Now that we've gotten rid of that problematic area, I can use this to help complete the square, right? We are going to do this right here and complete the perfect square. Problem is, we're going to have to do something here, add something here to make it a perfect square, right? We said that the minus 5 does not allow me to create a perfect square from it. So we're going to have to create a perfect square here. Now, to do this, this is the completing the square method. We are going to take the coefficient of my middle right here. What is the coefficient of my middle? Negative 2. All right? Take negative 2 and cut it in half, or divide it by 2. What would you get? Then you are going to square it to create a perfect square. What is negative 1 squared? 1. This right here, the answer you get from this is what you are going to add to this side right here. That other work you can do off to the side. Now, did I change this equation in any way? When I added 1, did I change what I originally had? Obviously, if I add anything to an equation, I've changed it, right? All right? What I do to one side, though, I must also do to the other, right? So we have to add that 1 to the other side to make it equivalent, right? If I added 1 to one side, I've got to do the same thing to the other side, correct? So now, what do I have on this side? y plus 6 is equal to x squared minus 2x plus 1. Is this a perfect square? Hopefully, we completed the square, the, did the completing the square process correctly, we'll have a perfect square here. Well, do we have a perfect square? Remember, we squared it here, so the answer here should be a square itself. That's why we had to square it at the end, because otherwise the number we put here wouldn't be necessarily a perfect square, right? So we squared it so it certainly is a perfect square. And what is the makeup of that perfect square? What is the makeup of this perfect square? I have to use the factoring skills that we've been working on constantly for the last couple months, right? And remember, we have a trinomial, right? So we got to multiply these two and then double it and should get my middle term. Do I? So it is a perfect square, and it can be factored using the perfect square trinomial technique, which means it factors into what? X minus 1, X minus 1. What does that simplify to? Again, we're breaking this down. We haven't changed the problem in any way. We're just converting it from standard form into vertex form. So now, what do we get here? How do we simplify this? There's another way of rewriting that, right? X minus, one X minus 1 squared is equal to y plus 6, correct? Now what do I do? Remember, I want to get it into this form, meaning I want f of x or y on the left by itself and everything else on the right. So what should I do now? Here. Now I get y is equal to what? Correct? Now, is that in this form right here? Is that in that form? It most certainly is. So our answer in vertex form is y is equal to, or f of x, and it can be either way. Because remember, we can then substitute it back in, because we are dealing with a quadratic, right? Which is a quadratic function. Yes, that's the vertical line. So we get y, or f of x, is equal to x minus 1, quantity squared, minus 6. Now we just need to determine the vertex of this. We're going to practice this a bunch before we actually start graphing it. But we need to 
first get it from standard uh, quadratic form into vertex form and then determine our vertex. And remember, our A will control then how narrow, okay, how wide, and the direction that my vertex is going, or my parabola is going. So what is the vertex here of this particular quadratic function? Now, be very careful. Let's examine what we had in this particular original formula, right? When we are of the form A times the quantity x minus h squared plus k, our h comma k is our vertex. So what will our vertex be here? Now remember, it is of x minus h form, and you get h comma k. So what is my vertex here? Is this of x minus h form? What would my h be then if it's of x minus h form? Kind of similar to the x minus r form that we had in order to determine the possible rational roots, right? What will my h be? Positive 1, not negative 1, because it's x minus form that I need to have it in. So my vertex will be 1, comma, negative 6. You take whatever is the constant at the end, that is your y. You take the opposite, basically, of what is inside, and that's your x value of your vertex. So this is my vertex form, and that is my specific vertex of this quadratic function. The process is very simple. Okay? Heck of a lot easier than what the heck you guys were doing before. I told you that was the most difficult thing we're going to do, and we already did the second most difficult thing early on in the year. Alright, does that make sense? Any questions on how to go from standard to vertex form? We're going to do another problem. We're going to do something that when we get a coefficient here, because when we get a coefficient, that really screws everything up. Alright, so let's now take a look at number two. We're not going to get a bunch of homework tonight. We need to get through some of this intro stuff before we can actually really go through it and practice it. All right, so we have this number two here. We have this function, and I want you to get it into vertex form so that we can eventually graph it, right? What's the first step here? Y equals x squared plus 16x plus 71. Now, sometimes some people might not move the 71 to the other side. Okay, I do it to get rid of the problematic area and then eventually move it back. If you watch some YouTube videos, they don't necessarily do that. They just put this in parentheses and move that constant off to the side. I just move it because it gets it out of there. You don't ever have to worry about it. So the first step here is to subtract 71 from each side. Y minus 71 is equal to X squared plus 16X Plus, well, we got to figure that out to complete the square, to make it a perfect square so that we can eventually get into the vertex form. So, what are we going to do here? How do we determine what to add to this side? And if I add it to this side, I must add it to that side so I don't change this in any way, right? What you do to one side, you must do to the other side, correct? So, to do this, I take my constant, or my coefficient of that x term. And I divide it by 2. So we divide that by 2, and what do we get? 8. Square it to make it a perfect square, so that we have a perfect square at the end, because that answer is what we're going to add right here. And it better be a perfect square in order to complete the square, right? So what is 8 squared? Okay, so we're going to be adding what to this side? But because we added 64 to that side, what must we do to this side? Add a 64 to it, correct? And what do we get when we add 64 to the left side? Y minus 7 is equal to x squared plus 16x plus 64. Now we go through the finish completing the square. We're not done yet. We now need to make this the perfect square that it is. What is the makeup of the x squared? What is the makeup of this perfect square? What's the makeup of this? 
8x, right? Double it, does it give me my 16? Ah, good, it's a perfect square. We did this successfully, right? Now, we need to make it the perfect square that it is. So how do we factor that? x and 8, x and 8. What is, the, what is the sign that goes with this? Plus, because we have to double that, right? That's why we doubled it, to make sure it was our middle term. And so we get x plus 8 times x plus 8 is how we factor that. Now we can simplify this by writing it as what? x plus 8 squared. And then what do we do to finish this off? Add 7 to each side. So we get y is equal to, or f of x once we substitute it back in, is equal to x plus 8 squared plus 7. Correct? So our final vertex form for this particular function is that, which means my vertex, be very careful, is what? Negative, Negative 8. Remember, it's x minus h form, right? This is your x minus h. I need to make it of the form, so it needs to be x minus negative 8, and that is my h, or that is my x value of my vertex. And what will my y value be? 7. 7. Right? This right here is your final answer. All we're doing is converting it from standard form to vertex. Does that make sense? Now, that's easy when we have a leading coefficient of 1, right? It's pretty easy. Now take a look at number 4. What do you notice about number 4? It has a coefficient. So let's talk about what we need to do when we have a coefficient or a leading coefficient of something other than 1. If you want to take we're on number four right now. <clears throat> now, let's take a look at number four. So in number four, we have f of x is equal to uh, 2x squared plus 12x minus 4. Now, steps still remain the same. We still put a y in it, is equal to 2x squared plus 12x minus 4. And for the sake of not confusing you guys too much, okay, we're going to get rid of the problematic area again, the first problematic. One, we don't have a perfect square here, nor do we have a perfect square here. We're in real trouble. So let's first move the first part that's a problem. All right, move it to the other side so that we don't have to deal with it. Not white color. White, white color. This. And then we have what here? 2x squared plus 12x. We're going to have to add something to this, right? Problem is, we don't even have a perfect square in the beginning, do we? What do we do to this to make it a perfect square? There's a couple things. Obviously, we can multiply by something, but I'd rather not add more to it, right? I'd rather take stuff away. So we're going to factor out the 2, but only factor it from here. All right, so we have what? y plus 4 is equal to 2 times what? x squared plus what? Plus whatever we're going to add here to make this a perfect square. Now, this is a perfect square. And we're going to look at just this part. Don't worry about the two in front. We took out the problematic area. We took out both problematic areas, right? Now we can make this a perfect square. So take your middle, right? What is my middle here? Six. Six divided by two, or cut it in half, right? Because remember, we're splitting it up into two perfect squares, so... 
We want it to be x plus something times x plus something. And these two somethings are the exact same, right? So we cut it in half to find out what it is, right? What is that? So the threes are going to be going right here, but we have to square it to make sure we add a perfect square to this, right? And what is 3 squared? So I'm going to be putting 1 in the room right here. Now, here's my real question to you. We'll erase this for you. Right, we don't need to end up doing it here in a minute. Here's my real question to you. What did I really add to the right hand side of it? I put a plus 9 in here, but what did I really add to that side? Now, I really added 18 because I have to multiply it by 2, right? So when you add something, and you have a leading coefficient of something other than 1, and you add something inside of here, before you go adding something to this side, we need to multiply it by whatever's out in front. So I'm really going to add what to this side? 18. I'm really going to add 18 to this side. OK? Because 9, I didn't really add 9 to it. If I really distribute it back out, I'd have 18 right there, right? Because if I distribute this back out, I get 2x squared, right? Distribute this back out, I get 12x. Distribute this out, what did I really add right here? 18. That's why you have to add 18 there. Sometimes a difficult concept to understand. You really didn't add 9, you added 18. So now, what do we get on my left-hand side? It is equal to 2 times, well, let's factor that perfect square now into the perfect square that it is. It's the makeup is x and the makeup is what? So that means I have an x and a 3 and an x and a 3 and what are the signs? Whatever the middle is. Just like we've talked about a ton of times with factor. What does that simplify to? 2 times x plus 3 squared and then what? So we get y is equal to 2 times the quantity x plus 3 squared minus 22. And that is my vertex form. All right. And what is the vertex then for this particular now, of course, I wouldn't have you graph this because negative 22, that would be too hard. But the ones that you'll graph will be have vertex ones like this, a lot easier to graph. What is the vertex here? What is it? Negative 3. Not negative 3. Remember, it needs to be the form x minus h. So h here would be x plus 3. Oh, I'm sorry, it's plus. Oh, I wrote it wrong. So it is negative 3, right? Because it is plus and it needs to be what? Negative, right? And then what is the y value? Negative 22. Okay? Does that make sense? So it doesn't matter what is in front here. Get rid of the end before you factor out the 2. Because if you factor out the 2 here, and then you add it to the other side, you're going to end up forgetting to multiply that by 2 at the end, right? So do not factor out anything until you get rid of that constant. Get rid of it. All right? This is why I do the adding to the other side and moving the constant. Some people don't do that. I like doing that because then when you factor out this 2, confusion doesn't come in as much. You don't have to worry about it. Once you move it, you have not changed that 4 in any way. If you factored out a 2 first and then moved the 2 over, we'd be in trouble, right? So move that thing out of there first. Then factor out whatever is in front. If that's a 3, factor a 3 out. If it's a 4, factor a 4 out. Hopefully you won't have a crazy number in here where you get a fraction, but sometimes that does happen. All right. Do we have any questions on that? Any questions on converting from standard form to vertex form? The only homework you're going to have 
uh, I would like you to finish off. I'd like you to convert the first. Just, just do the first six, okay? Which just means you're only doing three more. Okay. Obviously, it's not much homework tonight, which is great. Okay. Tomorrow we'll go over the the graphing of this. I'm going to show you a couple different ways of doing this. The way you go with it is up to you. But finish one through six, because I don't have enough time to introduce the, the graphing portion. Okay? All right. So one through six is for tomorrow. All right? If you have any questions, just let me know, and I'll come around and answer anything you got.